Hello, dear influential leaders, movers, and shakers. Welcome to another episode of the Influential Executive Podcast. Today, it is just me, and I spoke to Antonio Nieto Rodriguez. And Antonio, he is an expert in project management. Everything we do once started as a project. The project is when you create something where the first was nothing. So this is probably one of the most important skills to have as a human being and as an organization. That makes me very excited to dive in together with Antonio and look at what do you need for a good project? What are some of the biggest mistakes that are made? Which examples do we see in the world of amazing projects that took place and projects that failed miserably? So this is going to be an episode with a lot of practical tips, things you can apply immediately. And what I love about Antonio's style is that it is very simple and straight to the point. So this is not, nothing complex, just simple common sense. The episode is sponsored by Earn More, Work Less. We help organizations and individuals work stress-free. On www.earnmoreworkless.com you can find all kinds of resources on how to work stress-free and specifically what the stress-free work system can do for you to prevent overwhelm, to keep an overview, to be more focused, more efficient and simply get more done in less time. That's it. For now, enjoy the interview with Antonio Nieto Rodriguez. Antonio, welcome to the Influential Executive Podcast. Thank you, Alexander. A pleasure to be in this amazing podcast. So really looking forward to our chat and interview. Very cool. So am I. Uh, you are all about project management. And I believe that many people in our audience sometimes have something to do with projects. So I can imagine that we're going yes. to get some valuable insights here. Yes, I believe everybody does projects. So, uh, yeah, looking forward whenever you want. Let's go. Let's go. Well, first of all, like, what is your definition of a project? Yeah, so my definition of a project and... Uh, and there's many, and, and the problem, there's many, and they tend to be very complicated. Uh, so people don't apply, uh, just uh, very simple. Uh, a project is, there's uh, something you want to achieve. Uh, there's always like a problem you want to solve or an opportunity you want to capture. And there's a start and there's an end. Project never, don't go forever. There needs to be a clear kickoff, and then there needs to be a clear deadline. Um, and there needs to be outcomes. So you put energy, effort, resources uh, to achieve those goals. That's it. Yeah. I like to define a project as you create something where there first was nothing, just an idea, and then making it reality. It's, it's, it's every time it's a journey. It's you do something for the first time. So when does this affinity with projects start for you? Well, I think I became familiar uh, with projects when uh, I, I was working with PricewaterhouseCoopers. And there we were doing a lot of projects and uh, I realized, wow, if this is the way of working, then uh, companies have many projects and they're very challenging. So this must be about 20 years ago where I started to be interested in doing projects and understanding projects better. Cool. And where are you now? What, like, what, what have you discovered about projects and how do you help others with that? Well, uh, I've discovered many things, Alexander, over 20 years. I've, I've come to realize that we are all uh, somehow project managers. Uh, that the future is looking like we're going to do even more projects. Um, I've also realized that very few people are really trained to be project managers, yet they're, they're all doing personal projects, they're doing company projects, social projects. Um, so this is also a big finding. The other kind of realization is that one of the challenges in project management is that 
it tend to be very complicated when you try to find books or methodologies there are a few well known around the world prince 2 pmi ipma they are very complex so people will just start to read the first page and then they will just be pulled out because it's too complicated so that's where i have been focused over the past couple of years to simplify project and project management uh, I would love to hear more about that because I remember being a project manager myself. Uh, it was uh, for a large bank when I was still living in uh, Belgium. And what fascinated me is how at the start of every project, we would make an effort to bring everybody around the table and yeah. predict how the next one and a half year would look. Like which phases would be in the project, which resources would we need. We would plan it all out very carefully. And then two or three weeks later, the whole planning could go overboard because some things changed, some people left the teams, and the whole planning was useless. So I thought, why do we do so much planning in advance? Well, we anyway don't know what the future will be like. Yes. Yeah, I think you've experienced the the hard reality of project management that you cannot plan everything in advance and and not even now. Now it's even worse, especially some of the the projects about digital IT. Uh, those are projects which you cannot plan. That's why Agile became so important and relevant because they were saying, forget about detailed planning just do and then you keep doing and testing and doing and testing. So yes, uh, I think the challenge with the project management that we know is that it was developed 30, 40 years ago by mostly engineers for engineers and in a very stable world, uh, which is not the case today. So I think project and project management is still valid, but it has to be reinvented. Uh, to be applicable for today world and that includes agile. I think agile has very good points But overall the way we deal with project has to be reinvented and that's something that is fascinating and You have the perfect solution with, <laughs> with With Antonio all projects become a walk in the park sunshine <laughs> lots of fun timely delivery yeah well within budget each and every time did you crack the code already all the time alexander <laughs> <laughs> i wish i think there's a big element in projects which is out of the scope or the remit of project managers but we are becoming more aware so the relevance of having a strong sponsor who is actively engaged who's helping you push and eliminate the barriers and getting support that's crucial so we spent uh, at least me i spent a lot of time more than uh, whatever book tells you with the sponsor helping each other to get the project through so that's something that it's in the way of looking at projects today that plays a big role the other big aspect which is outside the scope of project managers is the priority that that project has in the organization or in your private life if you're running 15 projects yourself you will you know you will never achieve 15 you might do one or two right the same happens in organizations so where the project takes place and the priority it has has a huge impact so if you're doing a project number 54 in the organization you're going to struggle and uh, and maybe it doesn't make sense to do it right now and let's focus on the top one and then we do the other one so these kind of elements play a big role in successful projects and it's something I try to focus in the new approach. Exactly. So you need a good sponsor. You need clear uh, priority assigned to the project. Yes. What else? What else do we need? I think projects, one of the challenge Alexander's or, or the beauties about projects is that you can have an idea tonight imagine in your company and tomorrow you call the team let's kick off a project yeah. it's so cheap and easy it doesn't cost anything to start projects it's super easy uh, everybody loves kickoffs we love kickoffs so it's probably one of the words that is used most in businesses but then who comes to the second meeting 
And once you still need to do a bit of work, nobody shows up. So I think there's a part on <coughs> on the startup of a project which is very important. And traditionally projects have started with a business case, but there's a phase before you go into a business case, which has a huge impact on the business case in the project. Often that phase, which is not planning, but is testing ideas, uh, doing small prototypes, deciding things that you want to cover or not cover, uh, determine the success of the project. For example, Alexander, the first iPhone, the Project Purple, started in 2004, officially in Apple 2004. The idea of having a phone in Apple was launched in 2001. So within the company, they play around for three years. But the CEO at that time, Steve Jobs, was saying it's not the right time to set a formal project. We're busy with iTunes, we're busy with iPod. Let, let's us focus on those. But you can explore on iPhone, do all things that you want, but it's not a project yet. So those three years were a great learning experience for the team that will later develop the project, a phone, in two years and a half, which is never seen before. So. I think that plays a big role. The, what happens before the project starts? The ideation, exploration, design thinking, lean startup. These kind of concepts have not been applied strongly in projects. I think it's time to use them. You mentioned an interesting word there. And although I'm pretty familiar with the concept, I'm sure that uh, many people listening right now would like to understand more about what you mean by a lean startup. Can you explain it in simple, normal people's language? What is the lean startup methodology? Well, uh, uh, Alexander, I'm not the expert on the topic. I know the key principles which I tend to apply in projects is uh, you try to build something which is called a, a viable product, a minimal viable product. So, or service that you want to test already with uh, some clients, internal customers, uh, show something so that you can uh, get a good idea if there's really uh, interest in your product. And then you set up a project, a formal project using some of the, the traditional concepts. But I think Lean Startup is forget about all this bureaucracy, forget about paperwork, just focus on the product, listen to your customer, listen to your gut feeling and, and do something in two, three weeks and then show it and, and get feedback. And that's, I think, never been applied strongly in projects, but we need to start doing that more and more. Yeah. And what I really like about the Lean Startup Method is that you stop assuming and you start just doing it and testing it. So you create something, something that's just good enough, the minimum viable product, something that you're still maybe a little bit ashamed of, but at least you can bring it out there and, and see what happens. How do people respond? What works well? What doesn't work? What would people like to see added as features? And now with this feedback, your version 1.1 is going to be 10 times as powerful as the best idea you could come up with with months of planning exercises. Yeah, yeah. And I think the big companies today, Facebook, Apple, Google, all these, they use this concept uh, uh, every time they launch something, Amazon. So I think we need to incorporate this in projects to do that, test it, and then fine tune and, and be clear on what you want. So what you know what you want, projects can be much easier to manage and execute. Yeah, yeah. You, you need to know what you want. That creates a great bridge for the private projects. So as you already said, there's projects uh, at work and there's also tons of private projects. Maybe you wanna rebuild the house or you're getting married or there's a, there's a yeah. child on the way, you know, all of those <laughs> things, they're projects. Even cooking a meal, it's a project. Yeah. So exactly. you said you, you need to know what you want. So suppose I'm doing a private project. How can I apply that? Well, I think you mentioned one example, which I find fascinating because um, you can talk to people who are a disaster in planning, who will come always late to meetings, 
uh, they, they, they're really, really bad. But once they decide to marry, uh, that project goes according to plan. They're never late marriage. Uh, so people who are not good, they're good on that project. So I try to understand why are you good in planning your wedding? Why weddings are always on time and, and you plan them 18 months in, a, in advance. Imagine any other project that you do in your life never will meet that deadline, but weddings, yes. So why? Why? So there's some elements, Alexander. Are you married? Yes. So you were an excellent project manager, I'm sure of your wedding yeah yeah <laughs> that that was a master and what happened there together there was really good teamwork with this huge project planning file in google sheets you know all the actions things that needed to be arranged exactly. responsible person the deadline like we exactly. had it all covered exactly you i think there's one thing that is clear on that example is that projects you're asked to run them or do them maybe just your boss asks you, you're not really convinced. That's already a big step towards a failure. Here it's best successful projects are volunteer basis. So I hope you were not forced to get married, but most of the people is a volunteer. I think that's a common characteristics in good projects is uh, don't appoint people uh, or don't force people into projects. Sometimes you need to, but the most successful projects have always had a strong volunteering basis. Uh, they give you the options to join. If you see there's something interesting for you or you want to work with the project lead or then that person uh, immediately commits. There's a, a bigger stake uh, uh, on the project from volunteers. And, and I think that's something that you need to try to um, apply in, in your projects. Um, that will help you throughout the project, not just at the beginning. Yeah, you want people on board who are motivated to take ownership and who really want to create something cool. Exactly, exactly. And in companies, uh, unfortunately, this doesn't happen very often. What you see is that people are asked to be part in a the project. They, they don't even check if that person has availability or interest. Most of the time, these people are fully booked already, busy with three projects and one fourth. And, and of course, that's another indicator of that project will not be going according to plan. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so hard to keep an overview of everything that's going on, especially when you talk about the larger organization. You know, there's the boardroom level <laughs> who decide which projects should take place. But even there, there's people with their own agendas and maybe even some egos at play. Then there's middle management, then there's the project managers yeah. and the specialists, and they're all just working on different things. And they need to continuously talk and align and have meetings to see kind of what's going on. How do we untangle all of that? Well, I think, uh, yeah, you're absolutely spot on, Alexander. This is one of the biggest challenges in in organizations, even if they're not much talking about it uh, uh, in like media or business journals, but it is a mess. It is very hard to manage uh, a project, just one. So many organizations have hundreds, 200, thousands of projects. So to managing and putting a bit of order there, it's not easy. So I think the first step is, the first step for me when I go into an organization is First, uh, educate the senior leaders. Um, those are the gatekeepers and gate openers and resource uh, holders who should be more disciplined. They need to be disciplined in which projects do we do, which projects we don't do, which projects we do later. Um, so that kind of, I was telling you, it's very easy to start a project, make it tough make it difficult just so that just the best go through not be subject just maybe 10 percent of the ideas become a project that's a good indicator yeah then one thing that happens in companies is they're afraid they are really afraid of stopping projects there's fear that nobody dares to say well that project we run it for six months it doesn't make sense anymore let's stop it 
let's remove everybody out from there and we'll, we'll, pl we'll place those people somewhere else in another priority project. No, that's, that's, you would think, Alexander, yeah, it, yes, of course, everybody should do that. No, it doesn't happen. So there's still a, a bit of emotional attached to projects, uh, uh, especially if it's your project, you're protecting it and you're defending and you defend your team. And so that's something that it becomes a challenge. Yeah. It, uh, it's one of the biggest that. challenges in business, I would say. Maybe you see behind me, there's a book with a red cover right there. Do you see what the title says? Can yeah. you read it? Yeah. E Ego is go the go enemy. Go. Ego is the enemy is the book title. The enemy. I love that title. Yeah. What? I love it. What is your experience with, with egos in organizations and where, do they, where does it come from and how do we deal with that? Yeah, and the problem with that is that somehow egos, big egos tend to go up faster than uh, team players in organizations. So uh, the challenge is not just the ego, but somehow they are promoted to higher ranks faster so but more and more it's clear that you want for organizations a team player you want somebody who is happy to spread and and share uh, the success and and be blamed if things go wrong uh, but somehow our systems today the rewarding the hr tend to reward more the the ego uh, high achiever solo player than the team players, which are considered weak, uh, not strong enough for pushing uh, objectives and giving bad news. So, yeah, I think that's a big challenge. And, uh, and for projects, it's the same. Nobody wants to work for a project leader who is just thinking about him or herself. So that doesn't work. And, and that you see straight away. So that's the good news that for projects, you cannot go forever being an ego person. It will not work. You cannot work in projects like that. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Makes sense. Makes sense. For people in the audience who are listening right now and think, yeah, it's all nice, uh, Alexander, Antonio. Um, I know that it's a mess because I'm in it every day. I'm either managing projects or I'm involved in projects. But like, what can I do? What is something that I, as a project manager, can start doing differently right now, today, in order to make things easier? What, what is the number one thing that you would advise? What I would advise, number one thing, Alexander, um, I think is um, they talk about events which are not attractive they're not sexy they're not branded uh, so nobody cares about their projects when you tell me we're developing a new hr system or crm platform or uh, a new cloud uh, web services who cares uh, we're developing a new process for intaking of customers who cares uh, we're doing a compliance project 3, 4.8, 2, who cares? So I think the project managers need, if they want to get some attention from the organization, they need to go deeper into understanding why. That's what I call the why of the project is, why are we doing the project? Why are we doing a CRM project just because it's a system that everybody has? No, we're doing a CRM project because we're going to increase market share by understanding better our customers, anticipating competition, and we're going to increase market share by 20% in two years. Once you start talking like that, Alexander, you get much more traction. Your project, which was at the bottom of the list, probably gets the attention on the top of the list. So when your people see the value that you're bringing, people will be very, very interested. True. And the why is also different per stakeholder, because frankly, when you say we are going to 
have 20% more market share and uh, we're going to be ahead of competition. And I'm like, oh, you know, why should I care if, if I'm not a boardroom member? So I can imagine there's different stakeholders and different whys. And as a project manager, you're basically just selling half of the time. Uh, yeah, I think you're spot on. This is a great observation. You're, you're actually a salesman. Nobody tells you when you're going to project management that actually a big part is about selling, understanding the people's needs. So you might be interested more of creating impact in, in, the, in the world or helping others. So how can that project bring benefits to you so that you will see the value and you can dedicate part of your, we call it discretionary time, time on top of whatever you're doing, which keeps you so busy. So yes, absolutely. There's different whys uh, which trigger. This is also connected to the purpose. I, I, I put a lot of emphasis in my new book and my methodology, Alexander, in purpose purpose-driven projects and um, and that came to my mind when after analyzing hundreds of projects and and thousands maybe and <clears throat> and many of them failed but many of them had a positive business case so I, I was wow this is amazing so a business case very positive very sexy lots of benefits and then at the <laughs> The end of the day there was nothing so i think business cases are important because there's a thinking process that you need to take into account what's going to be the investment what's going to be the return but have you ever seen a bad business case yeah that's right like, <laughs> you, you can present the numbers in any way you want and if you want to make something look good there's always a way to do it yeah exactly so I'm not saying you should ignore the business case, but what will drive the project will be the purpose. And, and that's why the really the, 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 the big thing behind those numbers. And that's where you will get just the engagement that you need to be and stand out when there's hundreds of projects. Your, yours is the sexy one that management want to know and support and teams wants to work with you because there's something in it for them too. That's, that is really good stuff. So for people listening right now or managing projects, what you recommend is instead of like using new technique or using a better tool or an application, you say, you know, just, just stand still for a moment, breathe, breathe. relax, yeah. zoom out, ask yourself, why is this project important? What value will it deliver? It's actually pretty simple. It's, it's, yeah, that's what I sometimes I wonder. What I'm proposing often is very simple. Uh, so I think uh, I'm, I'm doing just silly things, but I realize that simplicity uh, is not always, always there. Uh, we tend to make things complex so that they look more relevant and uh, yeah, I think you're you're right. It's just a question: Why are what's pro, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What benefit or what the opportunity is there we want to capture? If you cannot answer the why, then just stop the project immediately. Yeah, and immediately after that comes something that I find many project managers overlook as well. And the moment I realized it and I started to make it a priority, projects became so much simpler. It's very simple. This is about defining the desired outcome. Exactly. What, what are we creating? What does the future look like? What is our vision? This is not about we implement a new CRM system. It's almost like robot language. But no, with this yeah. new system, now the salespeople, when they're on their way to a new client, they can push one button and suddenly they hear exactly what the needs of the client are and the name of their children and their dog, and they are set up to have a wonderful conversation. And now our salespeople, they can have eight wonderful conversations in a day instead of only five. I don't know, I'm making it up as I go. What is the desired outcome? And the clearer that image is, the easier it becomes to manage it. 
exactly so that's the 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 approach i take to projects is with questions um i i develop what i call a project canvas and and the, the inspiration came from uh, two good friends alexander osterwald and and if ping pignon from uh Switzerland from IMD, they developed the business model canvas and they're so successful that I thought, why don't we have the same thing? I was discussing with them and, and they liked the idea. So I thought I will try to do the same. Maybe I can still simplify, but it's based on questions and anybody, you don't need to be a PhD or an engineer to answer questions. And that was the rationale for that. And and the what is precisely what you were saying. What do we want this project to be? What's the the limits or or just think very broad and then we just slice it into pieces. Uh, but that's what uh, you should be working with the team is defining the what, defining the what you want to build. Is it a house? Is it a with garden, without garden, uh, with domotic or not? And uh, this is kind of, what we call traditional requirements and, and scope definition, but those words are too complicated. Just let call it what, what do we want to build? What would we want to create at the end of the project? Yeah, exactly. I, I like to uh, e explain it with the metaphor of a jigsaw puzzle. Now yeah. the most important part of a jigsaw puzzle is the box cover. Because that shows the image of what the ultimate result will look like. Now you understand, you know, which pieces of the puzzle you need to collect and, and where they fit into the bigger picture. Um, plus, it makes it like a lot it. more fun than speak of requirements. I like it. I've never heard about that. I will steal it with pride and refer to you, Alexander. Uh, I appreciate that. I, uh, that is a very good point, yes. I probably got it from somewhere as well, but I forgot, so I have no reference to make. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about your projects, Alexander? What kind of projects you're, you're busy or you've done in the past? <laughs> I've done tons of projects. Of course, uh, the wedding was a huge private one. And I, I, I do projects all the time. For example, next week I'll be presenting a live webinar uh, mm -hmm. on how to work stress-free. So yeah. I'm having an image in mind of what the experience will be like for the online participants. And based on that image, I'm putting the different elements in place. So that's one mm. example. Um, I'm also yes. setting up a mastermind, a win mastermind in which I collect a group of really very positive and super ambitious entrepreneurs who, yeah, we, we're just so aligned on the way we view life and business. And I'm putting a mastermind together I don't know yet in detail what it looks like, but yeah. the image starts to take shape. So I start to talk about the mastermind with people and they respond and some of them say, sign me up, sign me up, sign me up. So I already wow. have, I have seven people signed up for something that doesn't exist yet. Nice. And wow. it is through those conversations that I understand more and more what the ultimate product will look like. Yes. So th these are just two examples of projects that are going on, but basically pretty much anything I do is a project because there's only two types of work. There's projects and processes. Yeah. And yeah, I just want to do something the first time, figure out how it works. And then I either delegate it or, or stop doing it. <clears throat> yeah. And I think there's another concept, which is of course very popular in, in Silicon Valley, but is the <laughs> uh, fail fast, learn fast. And, and I think that has not been applied too much to projects, but every project that fails or, or comes just about that, you can learn and do better. Many of the big successful projects were born from uh, several project failures. And I think that applies very well to startups. Uh, or personal projects. The first webinar you'll do is not going to be the best, but if you keep learning and, and learning from others, you can get very good. So that kind of lear learning mindset, uh, every project is an opportunity to learn, uh, is fundamental nowadays. Nice. Yeah. 
Yeah, one hundred percent true. Yeah, and like there's one. It's it almost feels like a, like a dirty word, uh, but I want to hear your opinion on it. And the word is governance. Uh-huh. It, it is one of the words <laughs> when I was still in corporate life. Like the word yeah. gave me goosebumps, and and like not yeah. kind. So what what do we do with that? What do we do with governance? Can we just throw it out of the window or? Is there still a purpose that needs to be fulfilled? And is there a way to make it fun? Yeah, yeah, you're addressing the key issues here. Governance is more a blocker uh, and slower, slowing down the projects than actually um, built around what they're for. The, the governance is a, a very important tool of projects because it's about accountability, it's about uh, getting resources and attention, but if you don't define that right, if you don't set the right ways of working, governance is just a killer of your project. Things, imagine you have a steering committee every three months. Uh, How can you do an agile project or any kind of project when the key decision makers meet every three months? Uh, that will never happen. So, yeah, I think there are some very advanced ways of um, one one person that comes to mind is Alan Mulali. He was the former CEO of Boeing. Uh, he developed uh, the 777 a uh, long time ago, not the current issues that they have. And then he became the CEO of Ford Motors. And he was the project manager developing planes. And... <coughs> The way he told me he looked at project were very focused on team. But in terms of governance, which is your question, what I found fascinating is they had a weekly meeting where uh, the key decision makers were meeting. Uh, all the, the big big persons, uh, with but they were meeting a half a day every, every week, I think it was on Monday. Anybody in the project, anybody in the organization could join that project by webinar, by call. They could listen in, they could, not maybe to the 100%, but 90%. They could be there and see what people were talking and discussing. So complete transparency. And the other thing that struck me is that they were looking for issues. They were happy when there was an issue. They were celebrating when their supplier could not deliver. It was an opportunity to work as a team. Uh, to find solutions and and uh, imagine that the head of engineering was saying, I have a problem with this kind of part of the, the plane. Anybody can help me. And suddenly people around the table, yes, I can help you. And yeah, I've done that in the past. And they were setting small testing because people were very open uh, uh, way of working. So in that case, I think governance played a huge, huge role. Uh, but you don't see that very often you're right it can be it's often a big problem yeah yeah all the paperwork i I remember it oh oh, oh. paperwork i was was always looking for shortcuts you know to just (laughs) get the paperwork signed off and put the minimum amount of effort in and yeah Yeah. it's uh yeah it's it's an interesting uh, puzzle to make a code to crack I, yeah, and I think paperwork, it's um, its what methodologies would push you to have. And I think that's because it gives a false sense of control. When you have a lot of paper, it looks like you have a lot of control, but that's not the case anymore. And you see that, for example, today, Microsoft, where uh, I think PowerPoints are banned and, and numbers too, because people say, well, numbers are from yesterday. You let, Tell me about the problem. Tell me about the, the opportunity. So. I think that there's a trend there uh, which is aligned with what you were feeling about papers. So no more PowerPoints in Microsoft. That's what I heard. They don't like them. They they just discuss and they talk. And I think that was the case in Apple when they were developing products too. So um, And no numbers, which I found amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I really like that. It's only been since, since a year or so that I realized uh, the difference between outcomes and results. Yeah. And 
the reality that a number is just a symptom of a situation that's been created. And Correct. when you chase numbers, you chase symptoms and you lose sight of the actual situation, the, the real life situation that you want to create. So I think it's very exactly. powerful. Yeah. And I think you don't need to disregard numbers, but like you say, they're symptoms or indicators, they're trends more important than a number. Uh, and, and unfortunately, management, business schools, they've been focusing leaders into numbers that you can measure everything, that you can predict almost everything. And that's so wrong. And that I think it's changing slowly and we're hopefully contributing to that. Yeah. Well, it has to change because uh, the companies who, who do not make that shift, they're going to be stuck in trying to control everything. And in the meantime, yeah. others like startups and new technologies, they're just flying by and they're going to be left with nothing eventually. Which is happening. You're right. It's, uh, they're, they're, to, the good thing today is that companies know that if they don't act, they will disappear. So there's that sense of urgency, even for very successful companies. Today, there's a sense of urgency, which is uh, great, which was not the case before with Kodak and Nokia and all these big gamers where they thought they would be there forever. Yeah. I, uh, I want to ask you about your book. Uh, in your book, you have described many different case studies from all over the world, all types of organizations. Which is one story that you would like to highlight here as, as an example of the most beautiful project that you have seen, a story that has really inspired you? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, um, I get this question often, Alexander. I look, I'm, I'm, I'm very kind of attracted to any time I hear a project, I look into it. Now is the SpaceX and and now Amazon moving into SpaceX kind of too, and, and, but they fell with the headquarters, Amazon project in New York City. So um, uh, Brexit, for example, is a project which I predicted uh, from a project management perspective three years ago. I said, no way, this project will never work. There's no why. Uh, the why the is, is fake. Uh, there's no governance or no or big leaders behind. This, the what is not clear. So. I'm I'm very kind of attracted or curious to look at projects, but one that came across which I was not expecting, and this is not maybe a business project, but more a social or global. It's what I came to to see in Rwanda. Rwanda, you know, there was a huge massacre, uh, Tutsis and Hutsis, and and that country was devastated, uh, almost a million losses in in weeks. And, and the, the, the guy who took the lead, Paul Kagame, uh, he said to change that and he launched several projects. One of them was to reconcile uh, two parties, two tribes who were killing each other. And, and um, by creating uh, ways of um, um, kind of um, per pardoning people and, and recognizing the mistakes and feeling sorry. And they started to build this new towns where people were cohabitating people from both camps were living together um, and in a world where it's more about splitting and separating and an ego like your book uh, base uh, approach from leaders i thought wow this is an example that if leaders want to work together and and put people together it's possible you just need to have a good project and and some of the fundamentals and linked to that project, which I found amazing, too, is uh, Rwanda was one of the most corrupt uh, countries in Africa. Uh, but Paul Kagame said to change that. And the way they thought to change that was by having a clean city. So the thinking was, if we have this project so that people don't throw trash in the city, that the city is clean, that we will ask people to be part of that project that they don't throw things on the on the streets they put everything tied up um, that will be reflected in the government so politicians will uh, immediately see that and will say we need to change how the, we deal here and and you, you can go to kigali the capital of rwanda is one of the 
you you would think you're in Switzerland. It's so clean, and and Rwanda has become one of the least corrupted countries in in Africa. I think it's number three. So after South Africa, and so it, it's just amazing. These kind of projects where there's a vision, there's a purpose, where people are volunteer to they feel part of the project. Uh, uh, yeah, you can change the world. You can have huge impact. You can help people who really need help. So uh, those are, for me, my favorites. That's a beautiful example. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Very creative. Amazing. I would like to invite you for a special element in our interview structure. It is called the rapid fire question. Sure. Okay. Wow. I was not expecting this. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to just be thrown out of your comfort zone and just <laughs> hope you're going to be okay and not say anything that let's focus on the positive. This is going to be cool. I'm going to ask you a few short questions. Sometimes a short question, sometimes just one word. And I'm going okay. to ask you to answer with one word, just one word. Okay. Final wow. question round. So here we go. First word. Leader. Team player. Freedom. Everyone. Inspiration. Marshall Goldsmith. Team. Real Madrid. <laughs> I'm going to go with Ajax. <laughs> <laughs> no, congratulations. Well done. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Vision. Bold. What's currently on top of your bucket list? Impact. What's your favorite spare time hobby? Golf. Cool. For a moment, I thought you were going to say yoga. I do yoga, but it's painful yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same for me. That's why we need to yeah. do it. That's a crazy thing. Yeah. <laughs> It's crazy stuff. What is the most beautiful organization that's currently operating on this planet? I would... Mm. Tough question, shit. Mm, you got me blank. I'm thinking about doing social good. Maybe um, um, World Bank, for example, United Nations, this kind of organization. Cool. Cool. What is the purpose of life? Have fun. I like it. <laughs> what What is the best or most impactful self-help book that you ever read? Hmm. Getting to yes. Getting to yes. It's about sales, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Final question. What is the most inspirational movie? Would you like to recommend to the world? Mm, good question. I <clears throat> inspirational. One of my favorite movies is called Il Postino. Um, it's an Italian movie. It's amazing. It's very touching. It's about Pablo Neruda. Cool. Il Postino. Brilliant. Thank mm. you very much. Well done on the rapid fire questions. 
That's always interesting to get to know. Not easy, yeah. Yeah. No. Oh no. I know. I'm happy that I'm the one asking the questions. So <laughs> <I'm not answering. laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was fun. Antonia, this was a lot of fun and also very valuable. I love how your view on project management is just simple and, and it's more about common sense than it is about uh, complicated models. So, so that made it really easy to understand. Now, for everyone listening, wants to stay in touch with you, wants to hear more from you, where do they go? Yeah. Well, uh, first, it was a pleasure, Alexander. I really enjoy uh, this kind of dialogue more than question and answer. But uh, I learn about you. I learn what you're doing. You learn from me. So I love this. It's like being in a bar, but we're connected through the Internet. Cool, huh? And if people can learn from it, even better. And I uh, appreciate what you're doing, sharing knowledge. I think that's, that's massive. So congratulations and thank you for me having me there in terms of reaching me. I think nowadays you just type the name Antonio Nieto Rodriguez and you find me. You have, I have a website with my name linking. The problem is that I'd reached the 30,000 limit connection. So <clears throat> I, I, I do accept sometimes, but it's a bit of a mess. You need to delete connections. You know how it is. So, uh, but to reach out is, is also possible by messages there or Facebook. Uh, I tend to reply to all, all the messages. I think if you want to be present on the, around the world, you need to be reactive into uh, uh, people's questions or suggestions. So uh, feel free to reach out to anybody who's interested. Cool, cool. And I, what is the type of project that people can wake you up in the middle of the night. People can message you any moment. You say, <laughs> these type of projects, you know, please contact me because that's where I'm at my best. I, I love any kind of projects, Alexander. I think there, there's always something interesting in, in, in a personal project, in a big project. So I'm, I'm really so curious to find out new things that it can be an event that you're planning. It can be... Well, wedding, no, please, not weddings, <laughs> uh, but anything else, yes, uh, an IT project, a big transformation, digital, strategic, M&A, uh, but personal and, and entrepreneurship projects. I think there's a lot to, to be done there, too. Uh, they can use some of these techniques as well. Very cool. And uh, if somebody uh, asks you to manage Brexit? <laughs> I would not accept that. I think if you don't believe in a project, then it will never work. Uh, of course, if they pay me millions, I will pretend and try. But these things you cannot lie, Alexander, is do you believe in the project? That's a question you need to make yourself. And if you don't believe, uh, well, you can make a good living, you can make money, but that project will not succeed. Um, so, yes, I would take it, uh, but to make it fail. <laughs> I don't believe uh, on that kind of yeah well fair point fair point I, I think it's the only way to live is to put your energy into things you believe in right and okay. burnout rates are ever, higher than ever before and I think okay. a huge part of it is because people are chasing something that they don't really believe in that doesn't energize them so uh, absolutely absolutely yeah Brilliant. Antonio, thank you for this wonderful interview. Time flew by and that's the characteristic wow, yeah. of these conversations. You know, one hour passes, poof, just like that. I yeah. enjoyed it very much. And I uh, have the sense that we're going to hear more of each other because um, yeah, sometimes you just feel when we're on the same frequency. Yeah. And that yeah. made me very much enjoy the conversation. Me too, Alexander, really. Um, let me come. Let me know if you come around here. In uh, when I'm in Brussels, I'll take you out for beers and mussels and all frit and all that. And uh, yeah, let's keep in touch. Good luck with Ajax and Tottenham. Let's see. I hope you make it to the final in Madrid. That would be nice. That would be amazing. Thank you amazing. very much, Antonio. Take care. I loved this conversation with Antonio. For me. 
when time flies that is a great sign that means that there's engagement that we were both in the moment and we were just connecting sharing ideas and i believe that we managed to bring out tons of value i hope that when you're listening to this right now and you can think of a few projects that you are involved in maybe professionally maybe privately maybe both that you can take some things out of this interview and apply them right now today do you already know the why of every project do you really have a clear desired outcome defined or is there still some vagueness that you need to solve first this episode was sponsored by earn more work less we help organizations and individuals work stress-free because when you're in stress when you're hurrying and just running around to finish your task list then you stop thinking you're always busy and what happens actually in the mind is that your mind creates shortcuts shortcuts to just get things done rather than step back see the bigger picture have an overview and come up with creative solutions to think strategically that's why it's so important to work stress-free that's why stress and busyness are probably the number one biggest challenge to solve for businesses in the western world so what we do with earn more work less so on our web website earnmoreworkless.com you can find all kinds of resources blogs podcasts education because there's always a smarter way to do things to stay in touch with antonio you heard him best thing to do is type his name into google antonio nieto rodriguez you will find his website you can connect with him on linkedin on facebook as well and especially when you have a cool project that you like antonio's opinion on feel free to write him that's it for now i wish you a beautiful day let's all go out have some fun connect with people and create some beautiful experiences for each other. <laughs>